Hey, well, hi, everybody. Pastor Cal here. I am so excited that you're with us this weekend. I think you're going to be very glad you're here as well, uh, because this weekend we have a very, very special guest, and I'm delighted for you to meet a friend of mine. His name is Aaron Brockett. Aaron is the pastor of Traders Point Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, a church that not that many years ago he went to. They were running a couple thousand. These days they run about 10,000. They have four different campuses opening more, and it's just an exciting ride that this man has been on as he's led this church. Well, he and I have become friends, and, and uh, well, I got to actually preach for him a, a couple of months back. I, I, I preached in Indianapolis, and, and it was snowing. He brought me in in the middle of a blizzard. So I wanted to return the favor and bring him in the middle of our summer, but his schedule wouldn't work out. Yeah, right. And so this is as soon as I could get him. So it's hopefully still hot enough for him to experience Arizona. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to give Aaron an incredibly warm Arizona welcome. You know the drill, we want him to feel at home. So church, would you welcome my friend, Aaron Brockett. Hey, Central family. Hey, thank you, thank you so much for that. Hey, I was actually really available. I just told him I wasn't, all right. Uh, Hey, it is uh, so good to be with you, Central family. I have heard so much about you, and I love your pastor. Uh, Cal has been such a a friend and a mentor to me and an encourager, and uh, I feel like uh, this is kind of like home away from home uh, just because of the impact and the influence that your church has on us and churches all over the world. So it's a real thrill for me to be able to be here with you. And uh, I know that, um, I know kind of how this goes. Like, I know you you came uh, to church today, and you walked in, and you found out that it was a guest speaker and like you didn't know that until you came in. And I know, like, I don't know, maybe you're just kind of thinking, I don't know if I'm excited about this. Like it's sort of like, I don't mean to be weird about this, but it's almost kind of like a blind date, right? Like we're kind of stuck with each other for the next 30 minutes. And to be honest, some of you are going, I don't know if I like you. And uh, you know, and so uh, I get that. And so I wanna break the ice a little bit. And I brought a picture of my family just so you get to know me a little bit better. Uh, This is uh, my wife, uh, Lindsay and our four kids. Uh, my wife and I just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary this past summer, and so thank you for that. Uh, yes, yes, uh, please uh, pray for her. And, uh, and then we've got my, my three kids, my son Connor, he's 17, and then our, my daughters uh, Campbell, Kennedy, and Cadence. They're 15, 12, and 7. I don't expect you to remember their names and ages, but I wanted to show you just a picture of, of my, my kind of crew here. And uh, I had uh, one of these like kind of milestone dad moments uh, not long ago, it was just a few weeks ago when school started back up for us because my uh, son's a junior and my daughter's a freshman in high school and they go to the same high school and he's driving now. And so I had this like moment where I'm standing in the driveway watching them pull out uh, as they drive themselves to school now. And if you had that experience, isn't it such a frightening uh, moment because like you you can't be with them you can't control things like you're totally trusting that they're going to be responsible and they're not going to get distracted while on the road and and so I find myself like uh, super super grateful for all of the safety features inside the car that I normally take for granted as well as some of the safety features along the roadways that are designed to keep us all safe including uh, something called a rumble strip. You know what a rumble strip is? You you probably have been aware of it. You've probably felt them or heard them before, but it's the sort of like the the divots that are on the sides of the roads. I wanna read you the technical definition of a rumble strip. I had no idea that it was this extensive, but here it is. A rumble strip, also known as sleeper lines, alert strips, audible lines, sleep bumps, wake up calls, growlers, drift lines, and drunk bumps are a road safety feature designed to alert inattentive drivers of potential danger. By causing a tactile vibration and audible rumbling transmitted through the wheels into the vehicle interior, a rumble strip is applied along the direction of travel following an edge line or center line to alert drivers when they drift from their lane. And so what rumble strips are is that they're on the sides of the roads and they they, they give you enough uh, of a margin to know that you're beginning to drift. Like a rumble strip isn't all the way to the edge of the pavement because that'd be, it, by the time you hit it, it'd be too late to make the adjustment. And they're designed to actually get you from where you are to where you need to be. And we've all probably had that experience maybe uh, on a long road trip. Maybe we're driving through the night trying to get somewhere on vacation. 
Maybe it's just our daily commute and we take our eyes off the road for maybe just a split second and then we feel the sound and we feel that vibration of a rumble strip and it alerts us to potential danger. Now here's one of the things that God is really... uh, driving down into my life here lately is that not only do we need rumble strips on the road, we also need them in life. And I would say that God lovingly places rumble strips in our lives. Um, They are the principles that are found in his word as well as the promptings given to us by his spirit. And they're designed to keep us on the road and get us down the road to where we need to be. In fact, the Bible never uses that term rumble strip, but it actually gets at that point a lot through the scriptures. In fact, uh, in the wisdom literature of the Bible, the book of Proverbs, it says it this way in chapter four. Starting in verse 10, it says, my child, I love how uh, tender that is, listen to me and, and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. And when you walk, you won't be held back. And, and when you run, you, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. So the author of Proverbs is saying that you, you need to get wisdom. Don't just get knowledge. Don't just get experiences, but get wisdom. And then when you do, like hold on to it, like guard it so that it will keep you on the road and get you down the road. And we all need rumble strips in various parts of our lives. I know that for me, some of the greatest moments of regret for me have come when I've overlooked or dismissed or ignored the rumble strips, whether that's like a financial thing or a relationship thing or maybe like a personal discipline thing. And so here's the question that I just kind of want to lay out uh, for all of you today just to kind of think about in your own life is am I paying attention to some of the rumble strips that God has lovingly and intentionally placed in my life. Now, uh, this can come through like uh, personal conviction. Maybe it's like uh, when you're you're, uh, aware of, uh, maybe your your conscience is kind of bothering you. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you of something. And I wanna be super clear that, that God doesn't lay down rumble strips in our lives to make us feel bad about ourselves or to limit uh, the lives that we've been given. It's the exact opposite. God places rumble strips in our lives to maximize the lives that we've been given. In fact, Jesus would one time say it this way in John chapter 10, 10. And and some of you may know this passage, but I want you to imagine you've never heard this before. And these are the words of Jesus. He says simply this, I have come to. And if you were not familiar with John 10, and maybe some of you aren't, uh, how do you think Jesus might finish that statement? Like he could have said, I have come to, you know, save you from your sins, which would be true, but that's not what he said there. I I have come to, you know, teach you some good morals, uh, which would be true, but it's not what he says here. Or he could have said, I've come to make you religious, which he never said. Uh, He could have said, I've come to tell you to go to church. He didn't say any of that. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I've come to give you life to the fullest. It's one of my favorite things that Jesus said. In other words, Jesus is like, I want you to have more joy. And I want you to actually uh, feel like you're maximizing this life that you've been given. But I want you to stay on the road. Like, I don't want you to run off the road and run your relationships, your finances, your health, or your spiritual life into a ditch. So uh, this uh, past summer, I was uh, in Germany visiting a church that we partner with. And uh, I got to mark one of the things off my bucket list. Uh, My German friends uh, took me out on the Autobahn. And uh, I don't know if you are familiar with what the Autobahn is. Uh, A few of you are kind of responding to that, so it tells me that you you know. Uh, But for those of you that don't, it's a a stretch of of road uh, uh, that runs throughout much of Europe uh, in which large portions of it there is no speed limit as God intended, all right? And uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, uh, my friends take me out on the Autobahn, and I was not driving. I was in the passenger seat, uh, and I don't want you to judge me. Actually, you shouldn't judge me because this was totally legal. We were going 130 miles an hour. Now, because it was legal, it wasn't as much fun, all right? So that tells me something about my twisted up nature. But we're in, and we were in a VW Golf, which kind of cancels it all out, all right? (laughs) But it was amazing. We're driving down the road doing 130 miles an hour. And so I said to my German friends, I said, uh, so are there very many accidents on the Autobahn? 
And what they said surprised me. They said, not as many as you would think, but when there are, they're pretty bad. Now, I want to say it this way. Like, God has given you and me a V12 engine. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's just a really big engine. And God wants you to run your life. God wants you to live. That's what Jesus is saying. Man, live to the fullest. Man, maximize your relationships, maximize your talents, your abilities. I want you to live a life full of joy, but I want you to stay on the road. I want you to get down the road. I want you to go where I've intended you to be. And so God places these rumble strips in our lives, principles and promptings. Here's the other thing, though. God places people. It's principles, it's promptings, it's people in our lives to get us down the road. In other words, you you can't do this by yourself, and neither can I. So I want to show you a couple of pictures. Um, This uh, right here is a 1987 Chrysler LeBaron. This is the first car that I ever drove when I was 16 years old. May it rest in peace. And uh, this car, uh, the person or the friend that rode shotgun with me the most when I had this car was a friend of mine by the name of Kyle. And Kyle and I actually have been friends since we were really small. We're still friends to this day. And it's one of these very kind of rare friendships in which we have just been friends through various seasons of life. We're not related. We've just stayed in touch. And, and uh, our friendship really bonded during the time I, I had this car. And we had a lot of fun in that car. Actually, this uh, car had a, a manual sunroof in it. You remember those? Some, those of you that are old enough to remember. And, and you had to like manually take it out. And it, like, it was the 1990s were a strange time, all right? And so we, I, w- I would take the whole thing out and kind of pretend like I had this like nice little sunroof. And I remember one time uh, Kyle and I were out on this two-lane country road. Nobody was around for miles. And Kyle jumps up on the hood, sits on the hood. His feet are hanging down inside the sunroof. And I didn't want to miss out on the fun. And so please don't judge me for this. I think the statute of limitations is in effect here. Um, but I uh, set the cruise control and jumped up on the roof with him and steered with my feet, all right? The frontal lobe wasn't fully developed yet, all right? I still don't even know if it is, okay? Uh, but we had a lot of fun and, uh, in that car. Now, uh, God, when I think about my friendship with Kyle, I- I'm so grateful to him because uh, God has used my friendship with him to uh, encourage me whenever seasons were really, really difficult and I wanted to throw in the towel. He, uh, there's a passage in Proverbs that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I'd say that's, that's Kyle. Let me show you another picture. This is a 1991 Pontiac Grand Am. That, I actually, the one I drove looked exactly like that. And uh, I had this when I was in college. And the friend that rode shotgun with me the most when I had this car was a friend of mine named John. And uh, we lived on the same dorm floor. John was uh, hands down uh, the most intelligent uh, friend that I've ever had. He could speak intelligently to any subject. And uh, he maybe loves Jesus in uh, ways that uh, I've never really observed anybody else doing. Like, uh, it's just so uh, admirable the way that John loves Jesus and loves people. And John and I, one, one Friday night, we're often on a lot of Friday nights in college, we would cruise Main Street in this car. And there was this uh, religious fundamentalist group that would usually stand on the street corner and they would yell at people. And they would have signs that would like say, you're, you're going to hell. And it made John so mad that he would say, Brockett, pull the car over. And so I'd pull the car over right in front of this group and John would roll the window down and he would begin to engage with them. And then he would often get out of the car and he would engage with them on the sidewalk and he would totally dismantle their misuse of scripture. It was a beautiful thing to see. And uh, I did not have a whole lot to contribute to the interactions. In fact, I would like kind of stand there and I would just like, I would listen to him and listen to them. I would be like, And then John would go, Aaron, do you have anything to contribute? And I'd be like, I think you probably covered it. Sounds pretty good. Want to go get some tacos? Like that's about all I could contribute to the interaction. Uh, But here's what, uh, here's the thing you need to know about all that. Like some of you that are like conflict averse, like even just me mentioning all that makes you like your stomach twisting knots. But here's how John did it. John never got angry. John never got mean. John never raised his voice. In fact, he loved them Uh, just as he loved everybody else, but he was bold and he confronted them on their misuse of of scripture. Here's what it drove down into me, that I wanna continue to grow in my knowledge of God's word, but to never let that outpace my love of people. 
It was, it was God used that friendship to instill that in me. I want to show you one more. This is a 1997 Honda Civic. Uh, and the person that rode shotgun with me the most when I drove this car uh, was the girl that became my wife. And so we, when we met, started dating, this is what I drove. We got engaged in this car. We got married in this car. So clearly she married me for my money. And uh, this car had an interesting little defect. Um, it, it had a little plug. I don't even know what it was, but it was like a little plug in the engine that would, because of the vibration in the road, it would slowly come unplugged. So about one out of every 10 times I would get in the car and turn the key, nothing would happen. And then I figured out that you need to just plug it in and, and it would start. So I had a lot of fun with that. And so uh, whenever the car wouldn't start, I would just sort of go with it. Like Lindsay would be with me and I would just look at her and I would say, let me take a look. And so I would get out, pop the hood, and I'd kind of get underneath her. I'd go, try it now, honey. And she'd try it. Still nothing. All right, let me check the flux capacitor. All right, and so I, and I'd get under there, kind of, you know, move the car around, and I'd just plug it in. I'd try it now. She'd start right up. And she thought I was like a mechanical genius <laughs> throughout all our dating year, or throughout all our dating years and, and getting married until we got married. And then she found out that I'm a knucklehead. And, uh, but God has used, like I mentioned to you earlier that we've celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary and uh, I can't talk about this too long. I'm gonna tear up. God has, has used uh, her um, more than any other human being on the face of the planet uh, to speak into my life. In fact, I would even say that her voice sounds an awful lot like the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm beginning to not be able to discern the two. Because when she speaks, like not only does she build me up and encourage me, but she also says a timely word to confront me on some things that I need to be aware of. And I'm so, so grateful for that relationship because she keeps me on the road and moves me down the road. Now, here's the reason why I took you through a history lesson through my automotive background, all right? Some of you are like, thank you for this, but we didn't ask you to do all this. Hopefully at some point as I'm taking you through these cars, because you know what we drove can, can be kind of memorable, is that you're doing the same thing. You're thinking about maybe some of the cars that you've had in your, in your life and who was in the car with you, who was riding shotgun in your life. And I hope, I hope that you can recall some friendships and some relationships in which God used that individual to keep you on the road and to get you down the road because God is always bringing people into and out of our lives to grow us. And I don't think this is an overstatement, like without exception. Like you look at God's word, there was nobody running solo. They were always sent out in groups. They were always sent out in pairs. And Jesus himself had, it's amazing to me that he would come to this earth and then gather 12 imperfect, ordinary people to do life with. Even though they were imperfect, even though he knew. This, this blows my mind every time I think about it. When The day that Jesus asked Judas to follow him, he knew Judas would betray him. And he said, I, I, still, want, I still want you to be in my life. That's amazing to me. So here's the question that I just want you to kind of grapple with a little bit. Whom has God placed in my life at the right time for something that I need to give and receive? And that's the key to all of this, is that meaningful relationships aren't just give, 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 and some of you, that's what you do. And it isn't just take, 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 and some of us, that's what we do, but it's give and take. Look at what Solomon says about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9 through 12. He says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. And likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can we be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three or even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Now, it's one thing to read a passage like that through the lens of logic. Meaning, you read it and you go, okay, two are better than one, three are better than two. Got it. Lesson learned. Uh, I don't want you to stay there, though. I want you to read that passage through the lens of personal reflection and then application. So, in other words, instead of just understanding the concept, ask yourself, do I have that? Like, like do, do I have that in such a sense that if I fell in some way, would anybody outside a family even know? Are they close enough to me that they could lend a hand to help? And I could lend a hand to help them. Uh, 
maybe, maybe I could like say it this way. Like, who's your ride or die? You know that term? Like, this is a slang term that basically means, hey, we are so close, we're so tight that we will ride out any problems in this life or we will die trying. And I don't know, maybe it's two or three, maybe it's five or six people like that. Jesus, as I said, had 12. And if Jesus needed some people like that in his life, then what makes you and me think that we don't? See, when sin came into this world through our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, one of the very first things that was damaged was relational connection. Relational connection with God and relational connection with one another. In fact, one of the very first questions that God asked Adam and Eve after all that happened is he said, where are you? And I don't think that God said that because he didn't really know where they were at physically. It's because they were running and hiding. He was asking a question to call out what it was they were doing. And we've been hiding ever since. And there's another word for hiding. It's just simply called isolation. And this is the greatest weapon that our enemy will leverage against us. Is he, in other words, he won't just often come at you um, and announce it. Like he's not going to try to like get you to you know, commit some deep, dark, bad sin. What he'll do is kind of like playing chess. He's just positioning. He's just trying to slowly, one move at a time, get you isolated in such a way that maybe you don't even necessarily perceive it. And then all of a sudden you wake up and realize, I I'm alone. And in our society today, like even though we've got these glowing rectangles in our pockets and all the social media, we've never been more interconnected than ever before. Meaning you can just pull out your phone and just see what friends and family are doing on the other side of the world. And yet ironically, we've never felt more alone and isolated than ever before. And so I don't think I have to tell you that you can feel isolated even when you're sitting in a room full of people, maybe like the one you're sitting in right now. You can feel isolated walking down a crowded hallway at school. You can feel all alone, even though your spouse is just laying in bed next to you two feet away, but it might as well be 1,500 miles because of the emotional distance that exists between the two of you. In fact, there was a, was, there was a uh, study done out of Yale a few years ago by a guy named David Levinson, and he, he, this is what he found. He said only six out of 10 women say that they have close peer relationships that are marked by openness and mutual commitment. Six out of 10 women say that they have that in their friendships, but only one out of 10 men say that they have it. There's another study done out of Harvard a few years ago with 7,000 people over the course of nine years. And what they were doing were they were looking at the keys to human flourishing. And then there was a book written about it in which they summarized the study. And the book was called Bowling Alone. And a guy named Robert Putnam said this. He said, if you belong to no groups, but you decide to join one, get this, you cut your risk of dying over the next year in half. Which is why I think Central is thinking about changing their group slogan to get in a group or die. <laughs> but I don't think it's gonna work, all right? But I don't think it's that far off. According to what Putnam says, he says that social isolation is as big of a risk factor for premature death as smoking. And our emotional and spiritual health is just as much at risk. You see, here's why. We flourish as human beings when we are rightly connected to God. And that word rightly is so important. In other words, it's not religion. Religion is my effort to get to God. And God said, no, 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 no. I've actually done what is required to reunite us through Jesus. It's the gospel. It's very different. And so I'm rightly connected to God by understanding what, uh, Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done for me. And the same thing is true. Rightly connected with one another, meaning that there is giving and receiving. And when we are rightly connected with God and rightly connected with one another, then there is power in that. And there's also power in isolation, but it's, it's not the good time kind. See, whenever I'm isolated, uh, I just want you to know, some of you, maybe you can relate to me. When I feel isolated, uh, I'm more prone to temptation. 
When, I'm, when I feel isolated, even though those other people are around, I'm more discouraged. I can get disillusioned. I can create false narratives in my mind. In other words, we have an interaction. I'm like, man, what did, what did they mean by that? Why did they say that to me? And all of a sudden, I create this narrative in my mind that is not true, and it's even toxic, and I begin to rehearse that, and there's nobody there that can actually help me sort through it. When I feel isolated, I spend money more foolishly. I relapse into destructive habits that I previously thought that I'd overcome. I know that for me, it is a big red flag when the only voice that is comforting and consoling and counseling me sounds an awful lot like my own. Because I know that I'm not necessarily listening to other people. I'm just talking to myself. You ever watch those uh, nature shows where the lion is attacking the water buffalo? And the lion is smart. Like the lion knows not to attack the water buffalo when it's in a herd, but he waits until a water buffalo wanders off from the herd. And then when he knows that's happened, he knows that he can go in for the kill. And I would say that this is exactly what our enemy does. And he is stronger than you and he is stronger than me. But the good news is, is that he is not stronger than us. And there's a reason why God brings us together. And there's a reason why there's so many passages that speak to us being together in relationship and in community. And my fear is that more and more, especially in the Western world, is that as believers, we begin to like individualize our faith. And we begin to think, well, God knows where I stand with him and my faith is. Have you ever said this? My faith is deeply private. And so I can follow God in isolation. I can believe in God and just listen to, uh, you know, sermons or podcasts on my phone. I don't need to go to church or be a part of church or serve or get in a group. And this is really widely common. In fact, there's a statistician by the name of Ed Stetzer, and he interviewed a whole bunch of Christ followers. And this is what he found. found that only 21% of believers... So we're talking about Christ followers here. Only 21% say that they need to connect with others in order to grow in their relationship with Jesus. I about fell out of my chair when I read that stat. That the majority of us think that relationships are optional when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to growing. 65% say they keep their personal struggles to themselves. And I just want you to know that your faith, yes, is deeply personal, but it was never meant to be private. Th that's a foreign concept in God's word. And some of you might be arguing with me right now uh, to yourself, which are the best kind of arguments, by the way, because you always win. And uh, some of you might be like, well, how do you figure, Aaron? And, and I could just point you to a couple things. Uh, one of them are the very words of Jesus right before he left to go back to heaven. He said in Matthew 28, part of his great commission statement to us, at least a portion of it said this, go and make disciples of all nations. That's one of the things he told us to do. Question, how do you do that privately? How, how do you do that when you're all by yourself? Like you can't. We could go uh, Proverbs 18, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. In other words, I, I, I just, I only, I don't, I don't wanna hear what you have to say. I just wanna do what I wanna do. We could go Hebrews chapter 10. Let us not neglect our meeting together. This is what we're doing right now, as some people do, but let us encourage one another, which I would say is the primary reason why we gather together. Uh, the author of Hebrews would go on to say, let's stir each other up. Let's encourage each other. Why? Because I bet you something happened this last week that was deeply discouraging to you. And God always uses people to stir us up and to keep us on the road and get us down the road. We could go 1 Corinthians 12. All of you are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. There's an old African proverb that says this. If you want to go fast, then certainly go alone. You want to go far? Then go together. So several years ago, I was uh, about halfway through a message on a weekend, and I noticed that this man came into the back and sat in the very back row and kind of crossed his arms and uh, did not look very happy to be there. And uh, I immediately like was just sort of like watching him as I'm preaching the message because uh, he just stood out, meaning uh, he was very big and muscular. He had a shaved, bald head. Uh, two big gold loop earrings. He had tats on uh, all, both of his arms all the way up and down, totally sleeved out. And uh, I was like, man, I want to meet that guy. 
and I'd never seen him before. So as soon as I got done preaching, I ran off stage and then uh, it was in a full wind sprint uh, to the door that I know people exit out of who don't want to talk to the pastor. <laughs> oh, you may think we don't know, but we know. You're not fooling anybody. And I will see you there. All right, so, uh, so I go, I run, I get to the door, and uh, sure enough, like, I, now I need to tell you, he looked like Mr. Clean, right? You remember the, the guy on the cleaning bottle? Like, he looked like he'd come to life, like, right, stepped right off the bottle. So that's what he looked like. And he comes walking up to me, and he's, he's getting ready to walk out the door. And so I, I smile at him real big, and I said, hey, man, my name's Aaron. It's really good to have you. And I kid you not, like, he glanced at me, looked right past me, didn't acknowledge anything I said, just walked out the door. And I was like, well, that didn't go very well. Probably won't ever see him again. And uh, next weekend, about halfway through my message, Mr. Clean walks in, sits in the back, crosses his arms, doesn't look any happier to be there. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna give him his space. And so I, uh, I'm out in the lobby talking to people and he comes up to me. And he walks up to me and this is what he said. He goes, hey, you the preacher? And I was like, what tipped you off, Sherlock? Right, you're, you're sharp. And uh, I said, yeah, I am. And uh, he, goes, uh, he goes, hey, I was wondering, like, do you pray for people? And I was like, well, I've been known to, yes. And uh, he goes, well, I was wondering if you might pray for me. And I, that totally shocked me. I was not expecting that due to our previous interaction. And I was like, well, yeah. And I said, well, how can I pray for you? And he goes, well... My girlfriend and I just broke up. She moved out of my apartment a couple months ago and I just bought a house and I'm closing escrow in about 30 days. But I just found out yesterday that my landlord isn't going to let me out of my apartment lease for another six months. And if he doesn't, then I'm in real financial trouble. And he goes, so would you pray that my blankety blank landlord would let me out of my blankety blank lease? And I said, uh, man, I'd be happy to. Uh, I said, could I pray for you right now? And he was not expecting that. He goes, can you do that? And I was like, just a second. <laughs> yeah, we're clear. All right, we can do it. And so, <laughs> so I said, hey, man, what's your name? And he was like, why does that matter? And I was like, it doesn't, it doesn't. Just stand here and I'll pray generally in this general vicinity, all right? <laughs> for you. All right. So, so I, so I'm praying and I prayed that God would move in his landlord's heart and let him out of his lease. I cleaned up all the language. And then uh, while I'm praying, I just decided to slip it in there. And so I said, and God, I don't know the name of my friend. I don't know anything about him. Uh, I don't know if he knows you, but I pray that if he doesn't, that by the end of the year, he would come to know and experience the love and the grace that is available to him through your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And then I took a big step back because you just don't <laughs> know if he's gonna come out of the prayer swinging, all right, which has happened. And so I, I, I looked at him and he, he, had, he had some tears in his eyes. And I knew I'd hit a nerve. And I said, man, are you okay? And he goes, I love this. He goes, man, these allergies are killing me. And I was like, yeah, I know how that goes. And so he, he leaves next weekend, halfway through the message, comes in again, sits in the same spot, doesn't look any happier to be there. I can't get a read on him. And so I'm out in the lobby and he is walking up to me and he looks very, very intense. Like I just can't tell if he's in a good mood or a bad mood. But he gets up about maybe, I don't know, eight feet from me. And all of a sudden uh, he gets this big, giant smile that just overtakes his big melon. And it's, the, it's a smile that I would get really familiar with over the course of the next few years. And he walks up and he goes, bro, you're not going to believe this, but my landlord just let me out of my lease, man. And then he goes this. He goes, dude, God listens to you. So I brought a list. Whips it out of his back pocket. He's like, I need a new car. I need a new job. I need some hair. All right, it's just, it's going. I was like, whoa, 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 man. All right, number one, like you're moving awfully fast. Like I don't even know your name, right? Number two, I'm not Santa Claus, all right? And so since he was in a good mood, I'm like, hey, man, that's so great to hear. What's your name? And he's like, my name's Eli. And I'm like, Eli, man, it's really nice to meet you. I'm Aaron. And I said, do you want to go to lunch with us? And I, I knew that shocked him. And he was just like, yeah, I guess so. And so he goes to lunch with us. 
And then we got together later that week, and then I invited him over to our house, and I got to hear his story. And uh, he was probably at the time in his mid-40s, and uh, he told me that he grew up in Hawaii and a very abusive home, and as soon as he was able, he joined the Air Force just to get out of that abusive environment. He had a 20-year-old daughter that lived back in Hawaii that he didn't talk to very much, and his whole adult life had just been bouncing around from job to job, relationship to relationship, and he was just hurting and broken and alone. He said it took him about three months just to work up the nerve to come to church, and the reason he came late was because he just didn't want anybody to make a big deal of him. And so we just got to know each other. Here's how I did it. I said, hey, bro, uh, uh, church actually starts 30 minutes before you usually get here. So, like, can you come, like, 20 minutes before that? Because I've actually got something I'd like for you to, to do. I, I really did. I was, like, making up jobs just to get him there. Like, I'd be like, hey, man, pick that up and move it over there, you know? And so he would come early to do that, and then he would stay late, and then we would go to lunch, and then he kind of came over and kind of joined our men's group, and then we, like, went on a hiking trip, and we brought him. And it was just anything we could do for the next, like, six months. He was just hanging. And I will never forget that Wednesday afternoon when he showed up at my office unannounced, walked in, plumped down into the seat, dropped his head, and began to weep. And through his tears... He managed to get these words out. He said this. He said, Aaron, would you tell me how to get it? And I go, man, what do you mean? And he goes, would you tell me how to get what you and the other guys seem to have? And I go, what do you think we have? And he goes, well, I've kind of been around you for about six months, and I know you're not perfect. I know that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and he goes, but, but you guys seem sure of yourselves, but you're also humble. Like, you guys uh, have issues in your marriage. Like, you're willing to actually be vulnerable enough to talk about that, but you actually have healthy marriages. Like, like you uh, guys are generous, and you're hardworking, and you, you seem calm, but yet you're determined. It's just, it's just showing, going these, like, these, through these, like, tensions in all of us. And he said, how do I get what you have? And he said, just tell me what to do, and I will do it. He's like, I'm just tired of living this way. And I said, man, it's not anything about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. And I had the privilege of just laying out the gospel message to my friend that afternoon. And he responded to Jesus and received that love and that grace from God that was made available to him. And in the next uh, day or two, I got to baptize him in a hot tub in somebody's backyard, which are my favorite baptisms to do. And do you know where Eli is today? He's actually right. No, he's not. He's not. I, I, wouldn't that be so cool? Like if he stood up. But anyway, he's not. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's in Sacramento and he runs a ministry for boys that are on the streets who come from abusive backgrounds. Man, God has done an incredible work in his life. Get this. He didn't get there by himself. He, he needed others to to help him stay on the road and get him down the road. And you know what? So do I, and so do you. And Jesus knew this, which is why one of the last things that he prayed over us in John chapter 13 was simply this. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. New commandment. All right, what is it? Here it is. Love each other. Is that it? That's it. Well, how do you want us to love each other? Just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Now, look at this next part carefully. Verse 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That is an amazing statement. He didn't say, your knowledge of my word will prove to others that you are my disciples. He didn't say, hey, all of the acts of service that you do will prove to others. No, he said, the way you love each other. It'll be so set apart in this divided world that people will look at that and go, that proves that there is a God. So here's the question. How are we doing? Is that what we're known for? And I think you probably know that answer. 
So here's kind of the posture that we need to have as God brings people into our lives. You see, oftentimes, as God brings somebody into our life, we're a little nervous, right? Like our body language can kind of say buzz off. Here's what I want to ask you to do. I just want to ask you to do this. Just be wide open. Like, hey, man, so nice to meet you. Let's, let's meet on a regular basis. Let's get to know each other. Let's do life together. And God brings another person into our life, and, and uh, we know that they're struggling. And we're like, hey, I just want you to know that I really appreciate the fact that you shared that with me. That was, you got really vulnerable, I'm not judging you. I'm going to walk with you through it. And then it's not all like bad news. Like, you know, there are some people that we need to celebrate with them. Like, hey, man, I know that you've been praying for that for a really long time, and I just want to celebrate it with you, man. Just way to go, way to be faithful. And here's what's going to happen when you open yourself up. Like, they're going to get their mess all over you. And for some of you, you're going, uh, that's exactly why I actually don't want anybody in my life. Because, <laughs> because people are messy and they get their stuff. And that's one way to look at it, for sure. Or you can look at it this way. You can actually say, hey, you, you, you marked me. Like, I'm different because of you. Like, I'm better because of you. You, you brought some color into my life. Like, this is a beautiful thing that, that God can take and he can redeem. I'm more like Jesus because of you. This is a work of art. It's not a mess. See, the goal of life isn't to get through to the end of the life with a clean t-shirt. The goal of life is to get through it knowing that you've been close enough to people that they've contributed to your life, they've shaped who you are, and you've shaped them as well. So the way, so Central Family, you want to prove to the world that we are his disciples? Man, love each other really, really well. Be open to the fact that God brings people into your life, and you know what? Those people might hurt you. God can still even use that. Because the greatest weapon that our enemy uses against us is isolation. So don't isolate. Don't isolate, because God always uses people to grow people, always. Let me pray for you. Father, we come to you right now, and I thank you for this church. I thank you for the way that they are changing this whole valley and the impact that they have around the world. And uh, God, I pray today that um, regardless of what it is that we needed to hear, because I know that not everything in this message, everybody listening to this uh, applies equally. But I know that the way in which your spirit works is that you apply truth to our life in custom-made ways. And so God, whatever it was that somebody needed to hear out of this message, I pray that you turn the volume up on that and maybe the volume down on everything else and that they would know very clearly that this is what you're trying to communicate to them to both challenge them and to comfort them. And so, God, I pray that we would meet with you uh, here in these next few moments and that we would apply the truth of this message to our life. We thank you for being such a good and gracious God who gives us people to keep us on the road and get us down the road. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for having me. Love you guys.